Hello, everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and in fact, good evening to a, to a few of you. And welcome to today's webinar, Next Generation Auto Retail Dealerships 2030. Um, my name is Sumter Cox. I'm with Mood Media. I'm organizer of today's event. I will not be participating in the panel, uh, just kind of coordinating things here on the back end. But uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We are really excited about today's discussion. Um, this is the one we've all been eagerly anticipating. This is the third in our um, automotive recalibrated series and uh, really excited for this particular topic. We've got a great panel for you today and uh, promises to be a very uh, lively and interesting conversation. So, uh, before we get started, just a few items, just so you know how to participate in today's event. Uh, everyone is listening in via your computer's audio speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select the telephone uh, in the audio panel of your webinar interface, and the dial-in information will be displayed for you there. Also note that at the towards the end of the today's session, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions into to today's panelist by typing your questions into the questions panel in uh, the questions pane in your control panel. So uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, uh, submit those questions throughout the webinar, but we will hold them until the end. Um, but if you have one that comes up to you early in the session, go ahead and send it over and we'll make sure that uh, that's addressed at the end. So send them in at any time. Um, also note that today's session is being recorded and each of you will receive a copy of the recording following today's presentation. That'll probably come early next week. And lastly, wanted to draw your attention to the handout section at the bottom of your control panel. We've provided a couple of resources that are available for you to download today during the session. And uh, these are the white papers that uh, supplemented our previous two webinar sessions in this series. So if you were not able to attend one of those um, and you'd like to get the corresponding white paper for those, feel free to download directly from your control panel. And if you don't get it, we will also send that to you next week uh, as well. So with that, I would like to now introduce George Gottel of Uxus, uh, who is serving as our uh, more than capable moderator for today's event. Um, so, George, I'm going to hand it over to you to get things started. Uh, thank you, Sumner. I don't know how capable I am, but I will try my best today. Um, and yeah, welcome, everybody. Welcome uh, and welcome back to those that have attended uh, our previous uh, sessions. Um, as uh, Sumner mentioned, my name is George Gottel. I am the chief creative officer here at UXIS. Um, we are a strategic design consultancy. Uh, reimagining consumer experiences for companies such as Shell, Volkswagen, McDonald's, among many others who work globally. Um, I would like to introduce our esteemed uh, panel today. We have a couple of really exciting panelists on board that are really looking at the future of uh, mobility. Uh, why don't we start with uh, Martin. Uh, Martin, why don't you introduce yourself and say a little bit about your company. Thanks, George. Hi, everybody. My name's Martin Sewell. I'm the Managing Director of Rock Car. Now, Rock Car has been reinventing the way cars are retailed. Um, we've been doing that now since October 2014, and we developed an omni-channel or customer channel model that uses um, e-commerce uh, to enable customers to do anything they can do in a car dealership, but from the comfort of their own armchair. Where the Different approach to representation has come about. We have used stores in high footfall areas, primarily shopping malls, to take um, brands to the customer rather than relying on the customer to seek us out. Wonderful. Thank you, Martin. Welcome. And uh, David, why don't you introduce yourself uh, to the audience? Thanks. Yes, I'm David. I'm part of the team at Lincoln Co. Um, for those of you not heard of us, we're a mobility brand in our eyes, although we do have a car. Um, we're about to launch in Europe. Um, we, we really do want to be part of the change of, of future automotive, or certainly future mobility. Um, we've got a completely different business model as well as, as Rockar, and uh, 
we're predominantly online we're all about membership you can pay monthly for mobility and we give a complete support package around that and we do have physical places we don't call them dealerships that's for sure <laughs> um, and we'll be rolling them out more and more in in europe and trying to change the entire experience around it wonderful thank you david welcome and uh, two veterans of our webinars, uh, Seamus, why don't we start with you? Thank you, George. As always, a pleasure to be here. I'm Seamus Walsh. I'm the Enterprise Sales Manager for the automotive sector here at LG Electronics Business Solutions, based in Europe, and working with a number of automotive OEMs, uh, ecosystem partners to develop technology to support the next generation of automotive retail. So I'm really looking forward to this one. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome again. And not last but not least, Jonathan. Thanks, George. So my name is Jonathan Warrod. Um, I'm Vice President of Brand Experience here at Move Media, um, based out of, the Euro out of Europe. And uh, I deal with global automotive OEMs and uh, brands across the world, primarily delivering retail strategy and uh, engagement around digital experience and uh, creating compelling retail environments. So we're looking forward to, uh, to this session today um, as we talk more about uh, the future of the automotive retail industry. Thanks, George. Great. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. I mean, today's topic is, is very exciting. Uh, today's topic is next generation auto retail dealerships 2020 so, or 2030. How, does, how is auto retail going to look uh, in the next 10 years? So, you know, as we know, the consumer market is undergoing a revolutionary transformation in all sectors, not just in the automotive, uh, but particularly in the automotive, only because the automotive has not necessarily transformed as quickly as some of the other consumer sectors in the market. Um, our first two sessions, uh, we discussed the topic of, of omni-channel transforming itself into consumer channel, and then also how purpose-driven brands are leading the way in the market. And this final session, uh, we're going to talk about what automotive dealerships will, will evolve into in, in the coming decade. So in, in a time when brands uh, need to con continuously reinvent their experience, how uh, will automotive dealerships evolve in the next decade? And our first question, I'm going to uh, focus this one towards Martin, is uh, what will, and of course all of you can chime in, uh, what will dealerships look like in 2030? In your opinion yeah good question Joe. and i think i think at the outset very, very different i think what we're seeing is an acceleration to consumers moving towards their purchases online and automotive as that that becomes normal and there's some big players now normalizing online retail so you can start to separate the actual purchase experience from the brand experience and what we did some years ago when we launched rock car was take a view that we need to take the brand to the people and what we'd seen over the last sort of two decades is as oems become more powerful and larger their their requirement for their dealer network to invest in bricks and mortar got bigger and bigger and the only way you can make that viable as a dealer is to go further and further and further out of town so you're taking the cars away from the customers so it puts the onus back on the customer to drive to these locations so our view was let's take the brands to the people. So shopping miles for us was an, ob uh, an obvious choice. And if I look at the footfall in Europe's largest shopping mall, the Westfield, you're looking at 54 million people a year passing by. Wow. When you think about the context of a car dealer who's on some industrial estate on the outskirts of town, though the, the passing footfall is, is very, very small. So people, are waking up in the morning, they're turning to their partner and saying, we need to go and look at this specific brand and they'll drive there. So the difficulty is for all the other competing brands, if you're if you're trying to surface your brand in and amongst all this establishment, then, then you've got very little chance if you're gonna go and join them on the industrial estate because nobody's gonna be looking. But you can disrupt the customer's journey by appearing in these high footfall areas using some very clever technology, obviously, um, used to to disrupt that journey and entice those them into the stores and and that's proved very successful had covid not hit i would have said that we would have seen more and more and more people migrating or brands migrating to males but of course at this stage who knows who knows how that's going to maybe we need to take 
another fresh view of, of how do we take the brands to the people. But I think that's the overriding principle is it's I think we're going to have to make more of an effort to make it easier for customers for those those people who want to actually feel scratch sniff the products and uh, how, how to make it easy and convenient because that's what retail is right yeah don't make it difficult don't don't push them further and further out of town and driving down yeah. industrial estates to find 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 that these these fantastic brands they need to be there they need to be in in the in the public eye yeah, that's that's really exciting. I think Martin, especially because what you're doing is it feels like you're you're actually creating a seamless consumption experience for the consumer because they don't have to go out of their way to buy a car. It's part of their their consumer journey for many different things besides just automobiles. The automobile becomes a part of that experience, which I think is that's quite revolutionary. I think what it does, it transforms the experience for the customer with with you as a brand, whichever brand's adopting yeah. this model. Typically, a customer in automotive is visiting 1.5 dealerships before deciding. So in effect, they've already decided what they want. They've done all their research and, and they, they don't particularly want to go through the same linear process at each one of them. So they narrow it down and it's a fairly an immediate an, an, an immediate immediate sale for the dealer once they've met the customer they're likely to be by very quickly in the mall environment we're seeing customers will breeze into a store and they've they, they've just come into the mall to buy homeware or clothing the, the last thing they thought about was waking up and going out with a range rover sport but they'll they'll drift in and they go and, and they'll have an immersive brand experience they'll enjoy themselves because there's no pressure of, about being forced through a linear sales process so we tend to use the mal environment of the stores to deliver an immersive brand experience where the customer can actually start to enjoy the brand without the pressure. Introduce them to the concept of being able to buy the car online from home. Join, join up that customer channel so they leave the stores knowing how they can continue the journey when they want to. So it's, it's about empowering the customers to do their research on their terms when they want and how they want. And check out we can assist them to check out in these these mal environments or or they can check out on the train the plane the, they're back at home in the comfort of their own armchair wherever they like very exciting martin quick question for you do you see a separation now then between the online and offline experience in terms of that channel or for you is it is it is it always linear now do you mean john do you mean is the experience always linear in the showrooms or linear online well, that's the question, I guess, isn't it? Is is there a separation between online online journey, offline journey in the dealerships, and and do you see that in in, in your experience with the stores, um, in the way that customers engage, if they've already engaged online first, or they're coming into your physical locations because they're just looking because they've walked past? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. First of all, I think the online experience should be the same as the physical experience. So somehow work, work, it's key that you're working in your online experience into that point of sale experience so your platform in essence becomes part of the experience that the customer has so as i was saying before really the role of the people within these stores is to deliver that immersive brand experience and introduce them to proposition of the consumer taking control of their own purchase ex, their, their own research and pur purchasing experience so your your e-commerce tools need to work equally as well at point of sale as they do on a on a tablet or, or, or phone or pc at home uh, and and of course sorry john just to, to finish off the point it's not a linear it's not a linear experience whether it's physical or digital because customers we and, and that's the beauty of working in digital you can see customers coming on your platform looking at particular product coming off coming back in changing their financial attributes coming back off appearing in the stores and and maybe going for a test drive going home going back on changing the product again tailoring their finance so what you see through the data is you see the customer touch points are many they're just not that you know they've, they've looked at a couple of configurators and driven to the industrial estate and bought they they want they want to be able to tailor and tinker and play with the with the perfect solution for them be that funding or actual product yeah, very exciting. Um, you know, you're talking about dealing with a car purchase very similar to, you know, other consumer goods. So it's really part of the consumer brand world. It's not a separate sort of function like you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then you yeah. know, going back to your point about where they're located, I think that's a very interesting question. And, and maybe we could focus this one towards Jonathan, is um, where do you think or where do you see these dealerships potentially evolving? That's a great question. I think, you know, as, as Martin has said there, I think the future of dealerships is is rapidly changing. I think while we see a large number dotted around our towns today, um, you know, the, the trends would indicate that the, the sales outlets for automotive is going to considerably decline in terms of the number of locations because of their because of their location. Um, they're not really bringing in and attracting the customer uh, into their uh, environments today when so much of it can be well presented um, techni technologically online and they can get an experience of what the vehicle is and, and how to engage with the brand. And I think it's it's about how does the dealer network retain that customer interest and, and wanting to bring their customers into the, into the physical locations. To your point, George, about where are they going to be located, I think it's been well proven now that high footfall areas um, are going to be where automotive um, will be retailed going forward. And as we see a decline in the high street and other retailers opening up uh, physical building space, we could well see lots more of the automotives getting further into, into town centers again and presenting in high footfall areas. Yeah, definitely, especially with uh, post COVID when there's probably a lot of vacant uh, retail and critical in critical high streets and you know to martin's point about rock R and how it presents the brand as part of the overall customer journey in terms of their shopping day um mm. a lot of lot of opportunity there does anyone mm. else want to comment about location in terms of where these dealerships could end up popping up david i see you squirming i was a bit. <laughs> gonna say i wanted to make a side point on this i mean it, it's not just about location but you can imagine that if uh uh, automotive retail, if dealerships stay the same as they are at the moment and then just all move to shopping centers and malls, uh, you would have a mall full of all of the different brands, which would be a very, a very dull, very uninspiring walk mm. through the same experience one after another. That's just not going to work, I don't think. No. Um, and if you really do, I mean, let's look back 10 years and let's look forward 10 years. 10 years ago, we wouldn't be on this video call. It would be almost science fiction. So a lot can happen in that time. Yeah. And, but not to lose the part of the physical, I think the most important thing is, yes, you need to be where the people are and you need to offer an experience that makes the physical relevant. Yeah, not just yeah. about um, not just about taking the online offline. It needs to be somewhere that you 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 want to go to the third place something that you you see and identify with and would go there anyway regardless of whether there's someone who's going to try and put a tablet in front of you to to sell you a car that's that's not what i think people will want mm. in the long term no agree. no i agree david and i think it's got yeah. to be brand specific hasn't it you've got mm. to create you've got to create experience that ties that to the brand and, and when mm. you're going in an experience in that space it's not just a copy of technology and, and tools that you would see in the same in every different brand. It's all about that theater and all about how do we present the, uh, the brand values through that physical space. Mm. Exactly. And, uh, and the experience that you offer and, and, and what your philosophy for it is. Yeah. Um, and I mean, by 2030, we can have a bit of fun and say, you know, maybe you're not even driving a car yourself, so you wouldn't want to go on a test drive but <laughs> that's true yeah, yeah i mean we're definitely seeing that trend uh for test drives falling year on year on year and of course right now nobody can take a test drive but even even traditional dealers are managing to survive and we we just saw through one of our stores february where the sales were double what they were last february and nobody's taking a test drive nobody's touching a car physically they're wow. they're buying them online i think you're seeing there's new entrants here in the UK doing a tremendous job with Kazoo and Cinch, for example, and those guys are investing heavily in marketing and they're, they're normal, as I said at the outset, they're normalizing online retail and the, the customers don't touch those cars or drive those cars till they arrive on the drive. And the yeah. big difference is that they've turned the proposition around as we did, that, that most, uh, most retailers are scared of and that's surfacing the consumer rights about the online distance sales act. So they're offering and being upfront about if you don't like it, we'll just, we'll just take it back. You know, mm -hmm. for and, and that's something you have to overcome because 
it's a real pain in the backside to reject a car, right? People don't do it for fun. So there's a fundamental issue with the car that turns up that the customer is going to reject it for. So you've either misdescribed it or you've tried to hide the defects, you know, before selling it um, or, or, or something else. Something else has gone awry, but they, they don't just reject cars for fun. So you need to surface some of this stuff um, and to make customers feel that they can, they can buy their car online. And then that that the need for test drive, the need to physically diminishes or changes. And, and by the way, we're not forecasting the end of dealers because you're still going to need places to have them serviced. And that may well be the point for some of these really, really well established brands. There's no point. You know, everybody, you know, we're working exclusively and quite extensively with Jaguar Land Rover with our, our showcase store. So I probably didn't point out that we're actually a technology company. We're not a car retailer, but we work with. Jaguar and Rover um, to to power our uh, showcase store in terms of uh, having having the franchise there. So yeah, it's um, yeah yeah well great. I mean to to your point about consumer experience, um, maybe this question should be focused to Seamus. Um, what what do you think that consumer experience will be like going forward? We had a little taste from Martin, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit. Well, I think at the crux of what uh, everyone has said so far, actually, is this idea that um, the majority of visits to an automotive retail physical location will not be necessarily to acquire a new car. Mm. And that means that people are going there to do other things. And part of those other things will be part of the business model as well. So it could be that there is other products that it can be bought there that are the cars. It could be that there is other things to do. Um, so I think what you'll see is as the uh, the brands move to a more uh, membership, subscription, ongoing um, business model, they'll have to offer more alongside the traditional um, products and services that they offer. And so those will have to be brand aligned. But I think depending on your brand, you know, that could be seminars, events, entertainment, or, or just something as simple as a place to relax, come in and have a coffee with friends, come in and have an alcoholic drink with friends in some cases. Um, Only if they're self-driving cars, Seamus. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking 2030, so let's hold. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want any EUIs out there. <laughs> Genuinely. Um, but I think Seamus, really it sounds like you've, you've been in our in our planning meetings, really. <laughs> I mean, it's like you've got the script, but you're absolutely right. If people move to, as we say, membership and paying month to month, then mm. the, the reason isn't to sit and deliberate over the car. And we have to offer more in that experience. And, and exactly that. That's, you know, we plan to work with partners and they and allow them to offer their products through our clubhouses and we will offer coffee. And drinks, but not yet, George, with the autonomous. So none of them will be alcoholic. But you know, these things are coming, aren't they? It, it, it does. It really needs to be an experience in a third place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it throws up another question when they become autonomous is actually, do they need to be delivered to a dealer that then do needs to be delivered to a customer? Do they not just come off the production line and go to the customer's house? And, exactly. and when they need a service, do they drive back to a, a grey box somewhere that's on low-cost land and offers a better value for the customer? No, but you're, you're so right. I mean, that's you have to think about that when you say a dealership. What is it? 80%, 70% of that is devoted to maintenance. Mm. Um, and, of course, it made sense originally to put the, the retail in the same place. It's mm. cost-effective. But we're already yeah. separating those two things. And why does a customer even now want to go and take a car to be maintained? That's not the fun yeah. bit of it, the whole it's ownership the experience. Bit, yeah. is it? No. no. <laughs> Let's and just think, if we stop doing that, then the dealership definitely can be anywhere under a railway arch when it comes to the maintenance. But where do you meet where do you meet physically your consumers is the question yeah. we're talking about. I think going back to your point. David, about if if the mails just filled up with all the all the brands, it would be a pretty dull experience. And you're absolutely right. And and I think my point that I, I failed to make was actually if you take a brand like Jaguar Land Rover, everybody really knows that brand. It's well established, and 
um, and a well-respected brand. So it doesn't need to disrupt those 54 million I talked about walking through the um, shopping mall, but a new new to market, a new entrance perhaps, uh, or, so, or, or a brand that's reinventing itself has a, a window of opportunity to get under the nose of an awful lot of customers very quickly, which you just couldn't do uh, either through TV advertising or PPC, you would, it would literally break the bank, but um, it does give you an opportunity to get under the nose of a lot of customers. So I think um, coming back to your, your point, George, what will it, will it look like in the future? I think you'll see a rotation of brands through these high footfall areas, and I don't think it will ever become Motor Alley that we used to see uh, in all the major towns and cities where you know the planning would let us dirty, car types move in and um, take over that particular street so or, 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 or area. So, yeah, I yeah. think it'd be very different. There's one um, additional angle that hasn't really been discussed on, on this session yet, which is that there's going to be retailers entering, some of them are already just appearing on the market, who are not tied to a single OEM and offer exactly the sort of experience that we are describing, both in terms yep. of where, what it looks like, what it does, but the consumer who goes there isn't just going to buy a particular OEM's product. And so I think in the early stages, so certainly over the next, between now and five years from now, I would expect that we see those focused around maybe a type of car. So you will see an EV retailer, you might see a, you know, adventure vehicle retailer you know this sort of thing um and that will evolve and it will if anything move further away from oem so that 10 years from now we end up with a situation where the oems will still be dominant uh, in terms of their presence physical presence but we'll have a few of these actually also very strong multi-brand new car retailers who again don't have the legacy and are able to to use the sort of business models and retail formats that we're discussing on the, on this session today i think the the challenge to that um seamus is obviously to be able to supply a new car currently you have to have a franchise agreement so you can't just start as a as a used car super site effectively selling multiple brands you can't just start as a um a, a retailer a, a retailer or reseller of brand new cars without that franchise agreement but we are seeing more and more manufacturers moving towards um, a direct supply or agency supply which potentially could free um, ch or change that dynamic quite considerably if they choose to sell to those types of retail um, uh, outlets. And one thing I will say, I mean we, we tend to start treating the word dealer like a dirty word, but I, I will say one thing that a good dealer does really well is not just sell a car, but I mean, once you've got a car in your possession, you may have the same one for 10 years. You know? mm. And and it is that ownership and that and mm. that journey through the life of, of mobility that the consumer mm. has. And a, mm. and a good retailer does that job really well. And I think yeah. we need to think about how the physical space contributes to that part of it as well in the future. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously we're talking about a lot of interesting innovations i certainly find the multi-brand location very intriguing being someone who enjoys shopping um because again it, it plays into kind of a natural proclivity for consumers to browse and you know maybe spontaneously buy an automobile that could mm. potentially be something that becomes more common in the future if you have more access so in, in terms of all these innovations and maybe this question should be then focused towards David is what, what innovations do you see these enabling these changes going forward? What sort of things are you seeing uh, that are really transforming uh, not only the market, but also behavior? Yeah. Um, one thing I, I mean, I'm going to look Seamus in the eye and be very careful when I say this next thing, but the danger is to put the technology first. Yeah. And we're all tempted to put VR headsets in a retail space and hope that it flies. But, uh, it, you know, it, it must, must, must be about customer experience first. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, again, to pick up on what Martin said and, and really support it, it's the, the journey needs to be seamless. Yeah. So leveraging online and offline in a way that makes it make sense and enriches the experience. Um, I think when you 
visit the physical space you want to be able to see the, the physical product but exploring everything around it now can be really enhanced as long as it's in the background with you know better visualization being able to see a color in uh, that's maybe not in the physical but see it in a proper way to be able to do more exploring of the inside and the outside and, and as and as these technologies uh, improve we we just must be careful not to put them at the at the forefront but to, to make them part of the experience well, i think you're right David. i think we, we we discussed that on the last session a little bit about the future of, uh, of technology and uh, you know as much as seamus and i love technology um it is about the content you know to your point it's about the experience and the content that we can bring through the technology touch points that really make the difference and and we we explored last time that as cars continue to get more complex less mechanical but more complex in terms of functions and features, the environment in which you educate your customer needs to represent that sort of uh, experience to, to educate your client in, in terms of what they're getting, what those features are, what the proposition is of the product. Yeah, and um, not to forget the car itself. I mean, if, with our journey, you, you know, you should be able to sit at home without a vehicle, explore a vehicle on the web and then, visit the store and recognize the the configurator is still the industry word and then be able to take that same experience into the car as well and recognize the brand there now we've all got touch screens in the car mm. and and really our best task and you know all together the nerds we can sit at home with our vr headsets or uh, mixed reality headsets shortly fingers crossed but uh for the for the average consumer we just make must make sure that it's all in the background and the journey becomes seamless and enhanced so i think I that's what i'm going to say david it needs to enhance the customer's experience it doesn't need to take over and become yeah. center and stage that's 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 the key i mean because they need to have those basics in place because everybody i mean not so much now but the industry two or three years ago is getting all super excited about vr for example but but 95 percent of them couldn't provide checkout online <laughs> so they, they kind of leapfrogged <laughs> they kind of, they, well this is an easier one to solve because you know the, the, your point of view e-commerce um, it's still very difficult for most so yeah <laughs> so, it's quite, so you need to have the sort of basics in, in place before you add in and complement it is so true that, that yeah it's often and we're all guilty of it but it's often about what we can do we could yeah we could yeah <laughs> what, <laughs> should we should be. Be. <laughs> what should we do what is yeah. missing from the consumer experience and and, yeah, and yeah. as you, you yeah. guys know being you know when you sit at home and you've spent time you know with some brands making one of a billion possible choices and configuring something that matches your individual need you then want to turn up to the physical and and not have to start the journey again all over again yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. Which, which we all made that mistake didn't we so so yeah, yeah it, it's what we should do and i think to that technology. point david what you, what you don't want to do is get sold to when you come because you don't need to be sold to at that point you need to experience the brand you don't need to be yeah. sold a vehicle yeah and I, I martin i defer to you what's the statistic how many of the consumers start the the journey online and and turn up with a an already configured specification in, in our world ah, what's the number yeah but in our world it's 100 percent because exactly. you, you can only do it on the platforms there's, there's no yeah. there's no other way you can do it with us um exactly. and, I, and I, it's the same for everyone isn't it i mean mm. it must be and what your job and what you guys are doing well is making sure that when they arrive at the physical space it just carries on it carries on or if it starts in the physical space they can carry on when they get home isn't it it works both ways exactly yeah Absolutely. Well, I think that, that little discussion between the two of you then what that really highlights is that one of the innovations which actually is there now but it's not implemented by everyone is that you can have software that underpins everything from the point where you're designing your car all the way through to the online and the in dealership configurator sales tools whatever it may be all actually built on the same uh, architecture underneath software architecture underneath mm -hmm. Um, and I think that is often a part that is not done so well. 
that it's quite siloed, that a configurator is a configurator. And if you're lucky, through APIs, it's somehow connected to you know, other systems, but they aren't the same system. They're not different parts of the same system. Um, and I think Rocker does that very, very well in almost I'm holding, if I may say that, uh, some of your partners to reach that point. James, you're 100% right. And I think what, what you see going on in the motor industry today um, is the digitizing of traditional processes. So you've had the same way of doing business for 100 years. And a lot of it's to do with lead gen, but it's, it's a digitization of those 100 year old processes. And we've seen this time and time again where, where new entrants have come into established markets and stolen it from underneath the, the establishment because they've come in, not only have they digitized the customer experience, but they've looked at the overall customer proposition. Is it right? Is it contemporary? Does it, is it fit for purpose today, not back in 1975? You know, so um, the, the, the journey that is all, you always see across, across the industry it starts with the car first, and then the, the payments are revealed later. So or the way to purchase it. So by the time, if you think about the typical sort of linear sales process, you, you in, in, a, in a showroom today, it's meet, greet, qualify the customer's needs, present the product you think is appropriate, assess the part exchange, do a test drive, because everybody has to have a test drive, right? Then they build a deal. So about two hours later, you finally find out what your payment is. So if you turned on its head and dealt with the financial attributes at the outset, the customer then actually gets on and enjoys the experience of finding or building their perfect car. I think that's what we've tried to do. And the other thing is, and I've seen this against several iterations over the last couple of years, where even to ac ac access the online platforms in some of the OM sites, you have to enter your name, your address, your telephone number, your inside leg measurement, and you know, if they finally deem you're worthy, they'll send you a code and sit there scratching their heads wondering why they've got a 95% bounce rate. You know, <laughs> you've got to let customers do all their research anonymously. We have no right to expect all that data until they're ready to do something. And when I mean they're ready to do something, that could be to book a test drive if they want to book a test drive or save a car to an account for later. But it's only at that point we should be asking them. So I think till the industry sort of gets its head in, into the space where you should allow customers to be um, to, to travel anonymously through their research and purchase journey, they're gonna make, keep banging their heads against the edge of the fish tank because nothing's gonna change fundamentally if you keep digitizing 100 year old processes. And, and Martin, mm -hmm. to that point, do you see that the OEMs from top down are, are now starting to look at this seriously in terms of spending time? We obviously clearly David is coming to this very differently with uh, with yeah. Link and Go. But do you see that brands are moving in the right direction for this? Yeah, I, I do. And, and, and David is a great example. They're coming to market and they're looking at what's relevant for today. And it doesn't bear any resemblance to what's going on from from some of the, the established. Uh, brands. We we are Rockcar and, and our technology arm is working with a number of brands across the globe, successfully implementing what we're discussing to support their dealers, but using the agency agreement. So the OEM is actually the 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 transactor in these these cases, and they can then control pricing and the customer experience and the, the full customer channel is the same proposition, same price wherever the customer is, uh, and we're seeing a, a a march towards that speeding up rapidly. Mm. Yeah, and just to pick up what you said, Martin, we we often talk about digital disruption and uh, roll out the names of various brands that have done it. I would suggest that that's not about a website alone, and uh, I wouldn't even say that it's about changing the business model, although that can change things. When people get to be billionaires, it's when they fundamentally change the customer experience. That's what really makes the change. And we use the digital tools, and you use the digital tools, Martin, to support that experience being good. Mm, yeah, I think you're right. You look at Kazoo, for example, here in the UK. Kazoo, um, Alex Chesterman, very successful businessman, has entered into the traditional um, used car space here in the UK, a very large market. And within a year, the valuation of Kazoo is, is, is stronger than the, the top four uh, dealer groups in the UK. You know, go figure. <laughs> You know, he has exactly what you said, David, in terms of those those guys that completely disrupt and change the customer proposition, usually um, reap the rewards. 
exactly. Here's, well, here's everything we do. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're talking about kind of a no rules uh, sort of situation um, since we have we have about 15 minutes left uh, before we have to close the session. So, what if there were no rules? How how would you like to look at and and you know maybe each of you could answer that question or or just again have a group discussion like you're having right now. Uh, what if there were no rules? What if you don't have to have franchise models? What if you know the consumer doesn't you know has no limit in terms of of what the experience could be about? What where do you see this all going in terms of how how people purchase automobiles? Let me take a stab there, George, and I think it goes back to what uh, Seamus said a little while ago about, you know, do you do you go to a location because you're you've got a specific mindset that you want to uh, engage with a, a purchase or a, an agreement because of a certain lifestyle decision that you want to make? Do I want to have a, a, a sports car? Do I want to have a, a pursuit car? Do I want to have a, a family car? And I go and I want to experience and I want to understand quickly what my options are and what my choices are. So does it move towards that multi-brand type approach where I can go and experience that? I do my homework and I can go and, and, and get the right experience to tell me what the right decision making is. I think if there was disruption that's gonna happen, it's about sort of centralizing the approach more along what the consumer wants. What is, what is the type of vehicle they in their point of life are looking to purchase and can we present um, you know, those options in a, in a more seamless way. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what was interesting about what Martin also was saying about, you know, kind of uh, first quantifying the, the, the budget that the customer has and then looking at the spectrum of product that they can buy, right? So it's a little bit like when you shop for, I don't know, luxury products, you know, I've got mm. 1500 yeah. to blow, um, let me go to the mall and, you know, shop Gucci, Prada, whatever, until I find the bag that I really love, you know, and I think that, in the past feels very much like uh, banking and automobile purchases are very <laughs> aligned, you know, this kind mm. of formality of going to a dealership and it's all very rigid and, you know, it's all very standoffish. It's not customer first, it's, it's dealership first. Um, and now it sounds like there's a big revolution towards the customer being empowered, uh, mm. which is kind of a, a no-brainer it feels like but it doesn't seem like the auto industry has kind of uh kept pace with that um and i think it you know it creates a lot of excitement in terms of someone saying okay well i've got a few thousand to to spend on a car and uh, let me go to this multi-brand you know location where i can then select and look at what it is that will suit me the best and something that might get me really excited and and impassioned about driving the automobile and and connecting with a brand in a deeper way than in the past versus it being about mechanical needs. The, again, yeah, I would I challenge a little bit that it's not just about the purchase. It is about the experience after the purchase. We, automotive is very different. If you buy your Gucci bag, you can take it home and you can use it and you can own it for a long time. But you know, it, it sits and does what it is. The car is, is delivering you something else. It's mobility. And yes. uh, I'm, Want to, I really want to answer the question because, of course, we did start without the rule book. We said, right, there's the rule book, rip, rip it up, what would you do? Yeah. And we started exactly where Martin said we should start. We said, right, you, you need to know the price up front. We'll have one price, we'll fix it, we'll give everything in that price. Now we're done. Now mm. you can come and visit us, uh, you can subscribe online, you can buy online, it's entirely up to you what you do. And mm. if you come and visit us, we wanna give you a different experience. We wanna mm. make that place somewhere that you would like to go to and meet us and have events and we'll invite other people come in and use that space with us and we'll do all of those things. And then during the ownership, we never want you to come in and have it serviced. We don't want mm. you to do that because you don't want <laughs> to do that. So we won't have a dealership. We will, if it, if the car needs and all cars needs maintenance, we will pick it up and we will take it somewhere else and we'll bring it back to you when it's done. Yeah. And yeah. It, and again, maybe we're right and maybe we're wrong, but I think Martin has said it and I, I've said it, Seamus has said it, go back, start with the customer experience, build your, build the rule book around that. 
I mean, customer, yeah. you know, who was it that said successful companies are people that make money out of great customer experiences? Yeah. Yes. Well, especially, you know, uh, to your point, the experience is the brand now in the future. I mean, that's the core of any purchase or any connection to a brand today, you know, in terms of what consumers are looking for. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I'd like to be part of the come pick up the broken car and take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and by, by putting it in a car, just to be clear, sorry, Martin, you yeah, can't. Yeah. <laughs> you just need maintenance, don't they? Well, as you say, what you're doing is, the way you're representing yourself as a brand, you're, you're making some big savings by doing it differently, but reinvesting in the customer proposition and the customer experience. By doing that, you don't have to sell. We, we actually call it internally the art of not selling. So we, we tried not sell by empowering the customer to find out everything they need to know to make an empowered decision. If you're in that that beautiful sweet spot, you don't need to be doing anything else. You know, you, you, you've empowered that customer to make their own decisions in their own time. And think of the word. I mean, dealer, that's all sorts of wrong. You, I mean, if you are going to be in a shopping mall, you don't, you don't go to H&M and negotiate over your sweater that you're going to buy or a cardigan you don't you don't have to do a deal for that you know what it is and you know that mm. if you go somewhere else you're getting the price that mm. represents its value yeah mm. you're, you're right, right. And, and, market, and market price doesn't mean you're going to lose money i mean we and yeah. in, in the in the in the in the showcase business where we test all our theories and, and and refine our products all the time we have a fixed market price which is discounted from the RRP, but we can see the composite margins that all the dealers achieve, and we can see we're up, up, up above national average and close to a quartile in the main with with market leading volume. So, by fixing a price, a, a, the, 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 the market price, so it's not overpriced and underpriced. Again, you hit that sweet spot. It doesn't mean that your profitability is going to go by the window. It's it's not negotiating, not dealing that that dealing word. It's just something alien to millennials and Generation Zs that just don't get it. That you've got to drive to an industrial estate and negotiate over the price. That they, they you know, they say, what, "What do you mean I can't do it on phone?" That's crazy, <laughs> isn't it? You know, they don't, they don't get it. You know, and I'm now I'm in my fifties, and you know, if I was building a new business today, I wouldn't build it around fifty-five-year-old Martin. I'd build it around thirty-year-old David. You know, <laughs> you know, you, you you want some longevity in your business, so. Look at what millennials and Generation Zs want. Yeah, which is not so alien to what the rest of us want. It's just we got used to doing it in a different way. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think that's why you know come, coming back full circle, dealers aren't disappearing overnight because there are still people that will want that experience. And I think what we're all about is it's horses for courses. And you know, John and I have discussed about omni-channel, customer channel, but omni-channel in essence means giving people the choice to interact with you as a business through whatever channel they want. And for as long as people want to go to showrooms, then, then, then there will be. Yeah, I think uh, you're... Go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to say, what I would like to see is, um, I suppose akin to the, the Lincoln Co model, where I am a member of a club that speaks to me, that, that serves me something that I want to have not just the car I own and drive, but the way I live. And so, you know, I personally enjoy driving. I like the sensations of it, you know, the, the mechanics of it. I enjoy that. And so if, if I could be a member of a brand who could not only uh, supply me the vehicle I wanted, but could tell me which roads to drive it on, could help me to drive it better, you know, um, to, to make me feel a sense of progress of, of also discovering new things throughout that period that I'm an owner or a member of this club. That would be the approach I think that would uh, ring most true with me as a consumer. Um, and I think Lincoln Co does that um, very nicely. And I think there's other ways that that could be done to attract different types of consumers as well. Um, and so far, not much of the market is really addressing that. I don't think. Mm. Oh, and then like, let's do the 2030 thing again. And everybody is really going, doing the school run with autonomous posters. And uh, it's only you and me, Seamus, who are dreaming of sports cars again. 
and maybe we can only drive them in certain places but then it really will be about that identifying with the brand and identifying with the experience maybe we should be looking towards what harley davison have done for a long time now and make it you know you you identify with as a brand so much it's part of your mm. life and that's mm. what we should mm. be aiming to achieve mm. Yeah, it's interesting that you're all talking about this shift from dealership to club, from brand to lifestyle. You know, it's it's a it's a very uh, interesting because I think you know Martin to your point about millennials and their behavior. Um, you know, brands and products are something that they identify with in terms of how they mm -hmm. identify and and uh, represent themselves. You know, and so mm -hmm. I think it's a very um, interesting approach to what has traditionally been like you said a wheeler dealer you know negotiation kind of stress fest um mm. but, which leaves a very uh, negative impression you know yeah. with when you leave a dealership you have to struggle mm. to buy your your, your product mm. we have Indeed. about uh, five more minutes left and um i'd like you know maybe all of you have if you have some last thoughts uh about what we've just discussed maybe we could start i'm i'm looking at my screen right now and i have martin then seamus then david then jonathan maybe go in that order um last thoughts on the uh, 2030 position 2030. I think. What, is, what is the world of automobile retail going to be like George, I can categorically tell you it's going to look very different. There are going to be lots of new players doing it very differently, David and his guys, but there are lots on their, on their way that are going to put significant pressure on traditional OEMs and dealers to change what they're doing. I think the time to keep your head in the sand has, has long passed and it's now time for action. Um, and we'll see a lot of consolidation uh, between OEMs and, and, and large dealer groups, we'll see representation points changing, reducing, and, and, I, and I think it's a really exciting time. You know, I've been around the industry 30 years, uh, and I think the next 10 years is going to be the most dynamic we've ever seen, and we really haven't got into EV and how that changes things and the pressures that's going to bring into the existing um, supply chain as well. So, yeah, very different, very, very different. Exciting, very exciting. Seamus? Um, I think we've addressed business models, location, that sort of thing already. Um, so what I will say is, uh, if you could travel forwards 10 years, if you were to look at uh, you know, the inside of a shopping mall or a busy high street and you see an automotive retail space, it will look like a multifunctional space. It will be very obvious that it supports you being able to do different things. It is not all just around a physical car selection of cars that are in the window are very obvious. Um, that will take different forms depending on the brand. From an LG point of view, I think we would say that a lot of the uh, ability to transition between different ways of using space comes from digitizing it to a point, although I completely accept David's comment that you don't want it punching you in the face, that welcome to a digital space. You want it to be, in a sense, a, a platform, part of the built environment that enables transitions. Um, I think it'll be better. I think that's my final thought, that we're yeah. moving in a really encouraging, very positive direction. These sort of conversations are very, very fun um, because of the ideas. And, and talking with people who are implementing these kind of ideas is, um, yeah, it's really exciting for overall very positive absolutely absolutely david i i will find myself echoing both martin and seamus and uh managing if i can to avoid saying it'll look like a lincoln co club but um <laughs> the, it, again it is back to this thing of of yeah this it's not going to be about a space where you go and buy a car that's for certain. Whatever it looks like, that that is what it won't be. Yeah. And it does, I think, need to evolve into a, a space that su supports an experience and is multifunctional. And uh, uh, just to again echo Martin, people, all people, not just millennials, when they identify with a brand, that's what builds loyalty and connection. Mm. And, and supporting that is what people should do with their physical spaces. Yeah, good point. 
benefit and consumer empowerment. Jonathan. Yeah, so I think again, trying to wrap up what's what's been said, I think we, we're moving away, aren't we, from the, the acquisition of a vehicle to the, the appreciation of an experience. And I think this opportunity gives brands just a, a, a such a change in, in direction where brands can differentiate themselves on different levels than looking at purely their vehicles. Um, and to Seamus's point, the spaces that we will go into, the way that we will we will engage is going to be far more holistic in terms of lifestyle driven um, because we aren't making purchasing decisions going forward. We're making choices about the vehicle that we wish to be seen in, drive, experience and enjoy for shorter periods of time because we're not looking at investing long term. We're looking at relationships with brands because of our association with that brand and the, the value that it presents to us. Absolutely. We, we just had a, a question come in from the audience that we have just about three minutes left to before we have to wrap up. And uh, the question is, says that many dealers see their competition as other dealers of the same brand. Uh, this has resulted in many of the current practices built around price and deals. How do we overcome this? That's a very good question. I, I think that can be um, a really decisive step by our OEMs to move to an agency agreement, so direct selling. So the transaction is with the OEM and the dealer is rewarded for the um, customer interaction and the experience, the handover. So it's a it's a it's a fixed margin effectively. And you can maybe um, um, we we see this in a number of markets. We're working with a really well-known established German brand out in South Africa that's that's done this to really good effect and seen some amazing results around their customer experience and profitability for both the OEM and the dealer. Everybody, OEM, dealer, and, and, um, and customer in terms of the satisfaction. And it just removes all that, as you, as what did you call it, George, the stress fest that goes on in the showrooms around the negotiation. And that's what puts so many people off visiting. You know, we get, you know, we see the demographics through our business significantly younger than the network averages because and and the, the the gender split because it's those demographics that just don't want that confrontation they don't want the stress fest and if you yeah. take that price negotiation piece away it just all melts away can you imagine going in there and arguing over your iphone with the, mm -hmm. the salesperson i mean it just it's yeah. insanity one it's more question it. so it says uh, interesting discussion that's what they uh, mentioned um and how so how far are we by now to assemble a car online individually as the customer wants it's it's here today rockcar.com okay well there we go it's here today um all right well gentlemen it looks like we're at the end of our session um, unfortunately um thank you all for uh, joining us today it was a very interesting very stimulating discussion i think you know the idea of empowering consumers experience first consumer first uh is a transformational for the, the auto industry um, just so the audience is aware, um, as Sumpner mentioned earlier, we will be sharing the white paper and the recording of the session. Um, and I think you'll be all receiving this session as a recording or a link uh, next week. Um, thank you everyone for participating. We really appreciated you taking the time today. Um, I hope the audience found it engaging. And um, yeah, till next time, hopefully. Thanks everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, bye-bye.